Welcome, and we're here for a very special meeting for Maddie's Fund. Ask the Expert with housing law expert Diana Prado, the founder and president of Housing Equity and Advocacy Resource Team, also known as Heart LA. Heart LA is a legal nonprofit that helps ensure people and their pets remain housed. Diana is also an appointed public member of the California Veterinary Medical Board, a trainer and consultant for the Stay House Los Angeles Eviction Defense Program, and lecturer in law for UCLA Law School, teaching Los Angeles housing law and policy. Welcome, Diana. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here before during the holidays or before the holidays, all of those things. I'm so excited to um, talk to you all. And, um, and this is going to be fun. I'm like, this is going to be fun and interactive. So please feel free to ask questions throughout. Type them in the chat. If you want to say them out loud, feel free to unmute yourself. The thing that I do ask, though, is that when you do unmute yourself, um, tell me your name. Tell us your name for two different reasons. Because one, your name has power. Yay. And also, um, so we know who you are. <laughs> but no, it's truly. I'm like, your name has power. So I'm going, I'm like, we're going to get this party started. Let's get it started. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Okay. So here we are uh, today, the 21st. It's also winter solstice today, everyone. So we're going to have the longest night of the year. I know. Today is the start of winter solstice. Or today is winter solstice. Um, on all of my presentations, I start off with the land acknowledgement uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, as a housing rights attorney, I recognize and I know that we are part of a land back movement, that this land is not ours. Um, in Los Angeles, we are on unceded Tongva land, and we acknowledge the fact that this isn't our land. And so um, if you ever want to Thank you so much, Allison. If you ever want to know what land you are on, you can text this number from anywhere. And you can also go to this website, nativeland.com, and be able to know where it is um, you are, yes, what, what land you are on. Okay, I'm just going to get right started into it um, and kind of kick it off talking about what is an eviction, what is an unlawful detainer. An unlawful detainer is a fancy way, the legal way of talking about an eviction. An eviction is essentially taking people out of their homes is what that is. It can't be done via what's called self-help. An owner, a manager, a property manager can't just tell someone, hey, you need to get out of your house and that's it. And sheriffs come or police come to kick you out. No, there actually has to be an entire legal process to do that. It starts off with a notice a written notice across the states, a written notice is required in every single state to kick off that process. And then after that notice, and that notice gives the tenant um, like notice of, of what is happening. You have three days to pay rent. You have three days to get rid of your dog. You have three days or 30 days and it varies on the days. So each state has their own set of rules of how many days notice for a type of eviction non-payment of rent, or if it's a breach of a lease type of um, type of notice. Then after that notice is given, they have to file paperwork with court. And that's called a summons and complaint, right? They have to file something physically with court and pay normally money to file and start the legal process. And that kicks off what's called the eviction process. I want to, I want that to be made very clear because a lot of times people don't understand that there actually has to be a legal process to kick somebody out. And so many times, perhaps somebody will come to you or someone will call you and say like, oh, the landlord says I have to leave, so I have to move tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Well, unless there's been paperwork and something filed in court legally, they don't have to leave. The landlord's just harassing them. And so that's something that needs to be made clear. Um, after that happens, the tenant um, answers, needs to answer the paperwork from court to be able to like insert themselves um, and defend themselves. Then there's trial, there's court, and then the process um, at the very end, if the tenant were to lose, then that's when the sheriff does a lockout, okay? I'm gonna just pause too um, after each slide to see if there's any questions. Again, feel free to ask questions throughout, um, comments or whatever it may be. But this is the eviction process. Oh, okay. 
And let me go to the, is the process same across all states? Great question, Sarah. So in terms of requiring a notice and filing something in court, yes. But in terms of, here, let me go back. In terms of um, like the type of notice, that all varies state to state. So for example, in California, for a non-payment of rent case, it's a three-day notice to pay rent or quit. In New York, I believe they have 30 days. It's like a 30-day notice to pay rent or quit. I know, right? Hey, New York, way to go. Um, so it's, it, it, it varies in that, in that aspect. But in terms of it having to be a legal eviction filed in court, that's the same across all states. Okay. Yes. No, thank you. I love it. Okay. So somebody comes to you and they're like, hey, the landlord told me that I needed to move, that I need to do X, Y, and Z. So here are the top three things that we need to ask that um, that's going to get information out of the tenant that's going to be able to figure out how we can help them best. The very first thing, and if you've seen any of my other trainings, it's like now hopefully this is ingrained in your head. Did they receive anything in writing? Was there anything in writing? Because if there's not, that's just the landlord harassing them. Literally just the landlord harassing them. If they didn't get anything in writing, it's like all of us can take a deep breath. Like, whew, yes, is it still scary? Of course. Yes, is it still really crappy that the landlord's harassing them? Yes, of course. And also, nothing legally is happening. So that means that they don't have to worry about the fact that a sheriff is going to come a victim or they have to answer something in court because they didn't get anything in writing. Okay. If they did receive something in writing, then what was it that they received? And then you can go from there figuring out, well, you know, what is it? Is this because of non-payment? Is this really because of your, you know, dog or your cat or your animal? And then you ask, where do you live? The reason we ask where they live is because different laws apply to different, even cities. L.A. is different than even San Francisco. In L.A., there's rent control. In San Francisco, there's a different type of rent control. The state of California has rent control, but L.A. City has more protections in the city of L.A. for their types of rent control. Also, somebody can live in what's called like Section 8 housing or um, uh, project-based housing where they have where it's federally subsidized. And those have different types of rules and protections and regulations of where they live. Maybe they live in a mobile home also different sets of rules. So one, did they receive anything in writing? Helps us place where they are in this like alleged eviction process, right? That's why we ask that. Second, where do you live? What are the protections? What, what protections, what rights do they have? And then the third one, tell me about your pet. Why do we ask this? Well, one, because that's why they're there. They're here because they're thinking that they have to surrender their pet and they don't. And also, when you ask someone to tell them about their pet, it breaks down a barrier because everyone wants to talk about their pet. It's really the reason that the birth of Heart LA was to be able to bridge housing and animal rights, was to be able to talk to people, be, meet them where they are, and tell them, have them tell you about their pet. In talking about their pet, the thing, the kind of questions that you're going to, or types of information that you're going to get is... Um, you know, who actually is the owner? Tell me about your pet. Oh, well, you know, my daughter loves Fido, loves Fido, loves Fido. She's had Fido for, you know, five years. Fido really helps her. She actually, you know, has um, some type of learning disabilities. And so Fido really helps her and helps her with school. So now we know a whole lot about Fido, how Fido is this is this um, young woman's support animal, because now this un without the mother or the father, whoever it may be, even knowing, has told us about what Fido does, how Fido is part of the family, how um, and how someone in their family is a person with a disability, and now this pet is a support animal. So asking them about their pet gets information out that we're going to be able to learn how we can protect, what protections are available for these, for, for these folks that are thinking that they need to surrender their pet. Uh, and so I, uh, I always like to talk about the fact that there is not very much pet inclusive housing. And, and in LA, um, within the 25 mile radius of where Heart LA's offices are, there's only four properties in Los Angeles, right? In LA County, 
that had um, that allowed pets and only one of them had no pet fees right and this data was you know was um I'm like made available by my pitbullisfamily.org I'm like yay my pitbullisfamily and you know Shannon Glenn awesome um executive director over my pitbullisfamily will also tell you that it's very hard to find truly pet inclusive housing right and I share this because um Oh, I'm getting to this question. Can the notice in writing can the notice in writing be anything? Email, text, or does it have to be an official letter? Great question, Allison. It needs to be uh, like a, a paper, like a document in writing. So an email or a text does not is is not sufficient. It needs to be an actual document in writing. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like on letterhead. Well, and so for a legal notice, so this is where it goes. Every state has their own specific requirements, but in, let's say, California, if it's a three-day notice to pay, run, or quit, it needs to state certain things. It needs to give the name, the name of the person to pay, how much is owed, and the amount has to be precise. It can include late fees, um, where, when, the dates and times of where to pay. So the notice actually has to have certain requirements, and that's going to vary from state to state. But that's a great question because it is it is like a formal notice. It is a formal written notice that has to have specific things that um, that are required, and it and it and that varies from state to state. Now, does the landlord property manager have to show receipt of the pay or quit notice? They are going to yes, they're going to have to file what's called or prove in court um, what's called like a proof of service, proving that they served that notice. They're going to have to prove that in order to then lawfully evict the person. Do they sometimes lie? Sure. <laughs> sure. But that's what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to prove that that notice was served. And that's one of the defenses that the tenant has is that I never even got this notice. I never got this notice. And that happens a lot. That happens a lot. Uh, the reason that I'm also talking about the lack of pet inclusive housing is to, uh, really enforce the importance, reinforce the importance of making sure that we're keeping people and their pets together in their homes. That the first option isn't, oh, well, why don't you just foster your dog out? Or why don't you just move? That's not possible, y'all. It is very hard to find pet inclusive housing, let alone affordable housing. So if somebody's lived in their, lived in their home for over 10 years and they're rent controlled, they're not going to be able to find somewhere else to go that easily. Can the landlord legally directly give the court notice? Um, Corey, I'm going to ask, what do you um, expand on that? Okay. So, um, Hi. I'm asking, like, so, you know, sometimes like when people are serving notices, uh, it has to be through a second party. Can the landlord like come knock on your door and give you the notice themselves? Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's not, um, it's, you know, but yes, the landlord can do that. Okay. The landlord can knock on the door and do that. And a lot of the times, you know, a lot of like harassing landlords do that. Right. And they'll give like more than one notice. Like they'll give the same notice over and over again. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that also in, in California, for the tenant to respond, the tenant actually can't, when they're doing when they're doing what's called an answer, the tenant has to find somebody else to do that, which is so interesting. Um, but the landlord can give that notice themselves. Okay, there's a no pet policy. What do we do when there's a no pet policy? So one of the very first barrier, when a, First protections that we have both federally and statewide, it's what's called our, it's what's the fair housing laws. Okay. And this is where support animals come into play. So what's the first, uh, yes, protection that a lot of folks have. And even given now with COVID and long-term COVID, long-term COVID is considered a disability federally. It's been considered a disability. And so, um, and I say that because part of what is required to, in order to have a support animal is that you need to be a person with a disability, okay? A person with a disability 
um, physical, mental, emotional, um, some disabilities are not seen, right? So the person with a disability and then having their animal alleviates symptoms of that disability. If it's a person with severe depression and having their animal alleviates the symptoms of, you know, feeling depressed, then that is it. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to get to this, Adam. Then, then that um, makes that animal support animal. So an emotional support animal is also another, is an assistance animal. Another term for it is assistant animal, a support animal. That is part of the fair housing laws. So if you are a person with a disability and you have a support and you have a, a pet, but your pet alleviates the symptoms of your disability, that does make it an emotional support animal. So, so Adam, it, it is an emotional support animal. Um, so it does need to be an emotional support animal is the answer to that. It does need to be an emotional support animal in order for it to uh, apply to fair housing laws. Does that answer your question? Or you want me, or you want to talk about that a little bit more or where your question was? This is in all states. This is federal. Yes, there, this is federal law. So it's across the board in all states. And then each state may have their own then specific, um, specific laws. Like California's fair housing laws are more, provide more protection than the federal laws. And then regardless of the type of animal, it needs to be a domesticated animal. So it can't be, and it can't be an exotic animal. So it needs to be an animal that is um, the only other one that's like, um, that's excluded from that, that you're allowed to have as a support animal is like a miniature pony, right? It doesn't need to be the difference between a service animal and a support animal is that a service animal requires specialized training. You know, so the easiest one of this is like a seeing eye dog. Okay. And a service animal is allowed to go in all different types of areas. A support animal is not. Okay. A support animal, um, like, you know, can't go into restaurants or grocery stores. Must you have a disability to have an ESA under? Yes. Yes. You need to have, you need to be a person with a disability in order to be able to have a support animal under the fair housing, under the fair housing act. Okay. That's, that's how these fair housing laws apply. They apply to, people with disabilities because you what what it was doing is protecting folks that had disabilities to be able so that you don't get discriminated against them yeah uh, hi this is adam i had a question can you hear me yes okay great um so my, my question was about the uh whether the disability had to be emotional in nature to qualify for an emotional support animal or can like a physical disability qualify someone for a support animal yes physical disability so let's say someone has a um uh impairment with walking okay and having um their animal assist them alleviate some type of impairment with them walking Support animal. Any type of physical, mental, emotional. Is the person that... Yes, I'm sorry. Keep going. Just... The, I, I guess I was always under the uh, conception that the support animal or it's like it was an emotional support animal. So if the someone can have a support animal for a physical disability with a pet that does not have any uh, special training. Correct. Got yeah. A, a support animal literally doesn't have any training. That's the beauty of, yeah, it, it's the beauty of the support animal. There's no, no training. The existence of the animal alone is what allows it to be a support animal if, in fact, the person has a disability. The barrier here, let me go to this because I'm going to answer more questions. Um, the barrier is in the person, whether or not they have a disability, okay? And so the first thing that I wanna say is that you don't need, the way to be able to prove that you have, that you need a support animal is that you get a letter from a reliable person, okay? A reliable person, what does that mean? It can be a, um, a therapist, a social worker, a housing specialist, 
it could be someone, perhaps you over you at the shelter, you know, if you're working at the shelter or wherever you're working, perhaps you see somebody come in every day, you know them, you've been helping them with their pet, you know them, they've come in like month after month after month. And in talking to them and in meeting them, you yourself, you're not a doctor, right? You're not a doctor, you're a, but you're a reliable person that's been there and has met this person, knows them, has personal knowledge. And you're like, wow, I know that, um, you know, there is some either mental, physical, or emotional impairment that this person has. And every time that they come with their animal, this animal helps them and alleviates symptoms of their disability. Um. And so you, you yourself can write that letter. Can a veterinarian write your ESA letter? So a veterinarian, I think, um, doesn't necessarily know you. So unless they like have been treating you, right? And the reason that probably a veterinarian isn't, the veterinarian knows more your animal. And this isn't about the animal. So a lot of, let's say, therapists or healthcare providers are scared of writing these letters because they're concerned that if they write these letters, they're going to be liable for what then that animal does. If that animal bites somebody or if that animal, whatever, you know, jumps on the male person. And that is not what that person is assessing. They are not assessing the dog. They are not assessing the cat. They are not determining if that cat or that dog is going to bite in the future. They're assessing you, the person, right? So when a healthcare provider is like, oh, well, I'm scared. Um, I'm scared of writing this because I don't know what's going to happen. Be like, you're not, a, you're not a veterinarian. You're not assessing my dog. So I wouldn't say, I mean, if the veterinarian knows you personally and they can say that you're a person with a disability, sure, they can write the letter. But it's not necessarily like I would say, um, did I answer your question? I, would, I wouldn't say it's like the go-to because I don't know if that veterinarian is assessing you. And this isn't about the dog. It's about the person. Can a healthcare company restrict providers from writing a letter to you? Um, I mean, can a healthcare company like Kaiser? I mean, I've had issues with Kaiser. I've had issues with Kaiser not wanting to write letters. I don't think it's right. I mean, I, I, they should be writing letters. They need to be writing letters. But I know that Kaiser, different Kaisers have given um, clients that we've had in the past problems and haven't issued letters, right? Um, you can go, the other thing that I want to say is that certificates, online certificates are not, are, are not legal. That's not what's required. What's required is a letter from, again, a reliable person that says you are a person with a disability. They have personal knowledge of that. Having your animal alleviate symptoms of your disability. And that's on their letterhead. Somebody can call and verify who they are um, and be able to get that information as well. Yeah, it's a, Kaiser is, um, Kai, Kaiser has been, uh, Kaiser has been a problem. Y'all. And please also, I mean, my information is going to be at the end. Please feel free to email me because um, myself with other housing advocates, I've really been looking into this issue with Kaiser. So happy to, I'm like, you know, on another end, still discuss that to be able to, um, to, to handle that. Okay. Another myth, you can have more than one support animal. Yes, you can have more than one support animal. So what just needs to be proven is that each animal provides some type of alleviates different symptoms. How do we, how do we get to this? So normally this goes to the question of like, tell me about your pet. So let's say we have like uh, Lolly, right? Oh, Lolly. She's so sweet. Tell me about Lolly. Well, Lolly just is kind of like her name. She just lollies around and she just like lays. And then like, whenever this person is sad, Lolly just, you know, lays and lollies over and like cuddles with that person right oh and it's so sweet and it alleviates the depression that this person has because whenever this person is sad lolly's just right there just laying down but then we have like hoppy oh my gosh and hoppy is like a little puppy or like not like acts like a puppy and hoppy just like goes everywhere goes everywhere goes everywhere hoppy is super different than lolly right super different that's why hoppy is called hoppy so hoppy just hops around and like you know and this person but for Hoppy would probably never even go outside. Like doesn't even want to go outside. Doesn't even want to deal with the world. Is like, ugh, really? Humans? 
Ugh. right? But needs to go outside because Hoppy hops around. And so Hoppy provides a different type of alleviation of the symptom than Lolly does. And how do we get to that? By talking to the person, oh, tell me a little bit about Hoppy. Tell me a little bit about Lolly. And you can have more than one support animal. There isn't a restriction to how many support animals you can have. There are restrictions in each state and county and city of how many animals you can have in general, right? So for example, in the city of LA, you can have up to four dogs um, and five cats. In you know, that can be different elsewhere, right? In San Francisco, it could be totally different. Um, but you can have more than one support animal. Also, breed and size restrictions do not apply, meaning that if somebody, again, is a person with a disability and they have what looks like a pit bull type dog, the landlord can't say, oh, no pit bulls allowed. That's your support animal. Oh, no, your dog is too big. No, a support animal breed and breed and size restrictions don't apply. And at the same time, these fair housing laws apply to insurance companies. So let's say you're a person with a disability and you're applying for like, you know, renter's insurance or the landlord says, hey, um, how can I, you know, or I, you can't have your dog because my insurance company doesn't allow, um, my insurance company doesn't allow um, pit bull type dogs. If it's a support animal, that insurance company has to allow you to have it. Um, yes. How can you overcome breed or size restrictions for dogs or rentals? So this is one of the main ways. This is the main way. If you are, if you have a support animal, then you can overcome breed or size restrictions for dogs and rentals. Short of not have, if this not being your support animal, if you not being a person with a disability and, you know, and, and you don't have a disability, it's just advocating for changes in laws. I know it's a bigger, other than that, but this is why, this is also why a lot of folks are like, oh. Support animals are being abused, you know, the, the abuse of the support animals. And I just think that's, um, again, like a myth. N not only has it just been proven that animals increase our longevity, like our lifespan, that animals just make us happier, um, like happier people. Um, we can all agree that any animal that we've had in our lives has been a support to us. The difference is whether or not we have something, whether or not we have, we're a person with a disability, whether or not, you know, there is a physical or mental or emotional impairment that we have. And then this animal then becomes an official support animal. Um, does anybody have, I think someone may have their hand raised. John, do you have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Um, so as far as yes. Hi. size restrictions not applying, insurance policies are becoming more and more nuanced around pets. Um, so some of the breed restrictions are specifically about the pet doing damages versus ensuring the fact that there's a pet on the property. Um, the one that like comes to mind for us, we're here in Texas, uh, like dogs that have gone through some sort of process, maybe they declare it dangerous certain insurance policies won't cover dog bites essentially by specific breeds. And we've even seen some policies where it's like the dog's covered, but not the dog bite to somebody else being covered. Are you saying that support animals would make the insurance be required or, or it would be an avenue for someone saying, Hey, actually this insurance policy doesn't apply because it's a support animal before the fact that it's a pit bull or something like that. Um, okay. In terms of, let's say, the liability of the dog uh, is what you're asking. Like if the so insurance companies, what I'm, insurance companies can't deny insurance to someone who has a support animal to a person with a disability that has a support animal based on the breed or size of the dog. And if, and I think what your question was, well, what if they're saying that they're not going to ensure the dog biting, the act of the dog, which is so weird because then why wouldn't, I mean, isn't that why, um, I'm like, isn't that why the insurance exists? Uh, 
So some of the ones that we see, it'd be like, oh, hey, the, the dog. Oh, you went away. It keeps muting me. I don't know. Okay, it's here. Um, so we've seen different policies for different things, but it's been an avenue that we have seen he headaches for folks saying, hey, we don't ensure breeding size, et cetera. That's why you can't stay here. Hey, our apartment's policy is because you can't get renter's insurance because of breeder restriction, you can't be here. And then the third one would be that liability protection for someone who might have a dog that's been involved in a situation. So there's, there's kind of three pieces in there. Um, but I see yeah. how it covers the first two. Yeah. The one that I have is the liability for the dog, not just overall renter's insurance. Yes. You would a so, support animal. Yeah, so, let's, so that's actually great. This is going to lead to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to the next slide, this is, this is a perfect little segue. I'm like, I love this. I love when this happens. Um, so, and real quick, just so I can finish on this slide, you can't charge any extra fees. People can't, there can't be a pet deposit fee, uh, an extra security deposit fee, forcing to get renter's insurance or anything when the person is a support animal, when the, when the person, when the animal is a support animal. So, and I say this because I think a lot of the times, perhaps there's um, funding that your organization may get to pay for like pet deposits, but you don't have to pay that pet deposit if it's a support animal. I'm like, keep that money. I'm like, use it for something else. Use it for food or whatever it may be. Stop paying pet deposits. Pet deposits are not legal if it's a support animal. Okay. Not legal. Don't, don't do it. Um, or requiring renter's insurance. Um, monthly pet rent, absolutely not. Um, that's what, if it is a support animal, you do not have to pay monthly pet rent. No additional fees. Even if somebody else is paying, if another tenant is paying additional fees, it may be because they're not a person with a disability and that's not their support animal, okay? Again, these are for people with disabilities, okay? These fair housing laws apply to people with disabilities. Yes, okay. And then getting to the next question, my dog had an incident with another dog in the property. And now the landlord says, I have to remove my dog. See, it was like, right. What do we do? Okay. So there's something called a direct threat. Okay. In fair housing laws. Is this exemption across the United States? Yes. It's federal law. It's federal fair housing law. Each state has their own then specific fair housing laws that can provide more protections. So for example, California has stronger protections than, I don't know, some other state. Federally wise, if you're a person with a disability and you have an animal that alleviates symptoms of your disability, you are protected by the federal fair housing laws and you can't get charged any additional pet rent, pet security deposit, um, be required to get any type of like insurance, anything like that. Breed and size restrictions don't apply. You can have more than one support animal. You can have a support dog and a support cat. Okay. Now I'm going to get to direct threat because this is a good question that, that a lot of folks ask. Let's say the animal does get involved in an incident, right? This has all happened. Like someone calls up and like the dog got out or the dog like got out of the house and then like, I don't know, got in it with like a little scuffle with somebody else or whatever it may be. So if the animal causes significant harm and causes substantial physical, um, physical damage to the property of others and the harm can't be sufficiently reduced or eliminated by a reasonable accommodation, um, another reasonable accommodation request, that's considered a direct threat, okay? Meaning that there's nothing that can be done to reduce the harm. So I'll give, an, I'll give a practical example of what, how we can um, mitigate, let's say, um, how we can reduce the harm. So I've had instances or I've had clients where, yes, the dog got late at night, got out, got in a scuffle with the person or jumped on another person. And so how can we reduce that? Well, I can tell the owner that the dog is always going to be on leash. Another thing that we've always, that sometimes we've done is provided training, right? You can tell the owner that the dog is going to be in, in some type of training program, improve a training program is going to be helpful. Um, there's been even at times where we've offered to have a soft muzzle, be put on the dog for a limited amount of time when in, they're in the common areas. Um, 
and again, like a limited amount of time, I'm not just going to say that forever because you're also placing a burden on the person having a soft muzzle on their dog all the time. But in the common areas, let's say it's like a, in one of the cases we had, it was like a, a, a um, like a four story um, building. And so when they were in the elevator, right? So when they're walking down the hallway, going in the elevator, they put a soft muzzle on their dog for a limited amount of time. And then when they leave the premises, they can take the soft muzzle off. So that the harm can be sufficiently reduced at times, right? You just kind of have to think outside the box and you can ask for another reasonable accommodation request, a reasonable accommodation saying like, Hey, I get that the animal did this, but this was a one-time thing. And so some of the factors that we look at of what is a direct threat is the nature, what happened, the duration and the severity. So many times this is like a one-off, right? The one time where they're like, oh my gosh, I left my gate open. Ugh. Or like, oh, I normally don't like, I let, like, you know, my kid was holding the leash and then they just let go. How, what, what happened? How long did it happen for? What, what was going on? Why? Right? In one instance, it was really late at night that my client was walking, just happened to be walking their dog really late at night. And um, somebody came across the corner and like bumped into one another. So it's like, ugh. What was the nature of what was going on, right? What's happening? What's the likelihood that this is going to happen again, right? Is this someone that's like always leaving their gate open? Is this a dog that's like getting in a fight with everybody? What, what's the nature of what's, um, of what's going to happen? And whether or not asking for what's called another reasonable accommodation is going to mitigate those problems. Again, what does that mean? They're going to be in training programs. Maybe the dog hadn't been spayed and neutered and spay and neutering is going to help with some type of behavioral problem. Um, again, that soft muzzle. What can be done to mitigate and eliminate the problem happening again? So going to the question of the dog liability issue, if the dog has, um, you know, and also every insurance company has their own rules. If the dog has bitten once, a lot of insurance companies don't want to then... Um, don't want to insure that dog again. If it's a support animal, there could be there could be some wiggle room or some like argument to be made. But well, this is my support animal, and so it'd be going through these type of factors. Well, it only happened once. It um, isn't going to happen again. I went through training. Um, again, though, insurance companies are like private insurance companies, and so it's kind of like a battle back and forth. So it's kind of just picking the best insurance company that you possibly can. Um, but this is kind of like the framework of what we are talking about when there is some type of incident, okay? The factors to consider in a direct threat. And then, like, yeah, a best practices for tenants. Let's see what. Do you have examples of a housing training programs? So I meant more um, like um, pet training programs. So programs like behavioral training programs for the pet. Right. Um, and but I will talk about a housing training programs that um, we put on on Maddie's university in just a moment um, about evictions and learning more about your rights in just a second. But I was talking more about like behavioral programs for the pet versus like, uh, you know, versus oneself. Um, some quick best practices for tenants is always tell a tenant to get proof of payment. Stop. I'm like, stop paying in cash. Unless they're getting a receipt, but truly stop paying in cash. Pay either with a money order, the online portal, something that proves that you've paid, okay? Because you're not always going to get a receipt. A tenant isn't always going to get a receipt. And they can't prove what they've paid if they're just paying in cash. It, it, and um, also personal checks aren't necessarily cash because the landlord still has to go and cash that check. And then sometimes what if the funds bounce, Right. So we recommend either money orders or, you know, paying through the online portal. Always communicate in writing. If it happens by phone, then do it by text. Do text, email, anything in writing. And in the language that you speak, I repeat this. If you are a Spanish-speaking person, speak and write to them in Spanish. Just write the letter in Spanish. Write the letter in Spanish. You don't have to speak. You don't have to write the language in in the language and what the owner speaks. Um, for example, in California, this is a law. All contracts need to be negotiated, need to be written in the language that they're negotiated in. And so a lot of leases are English leases 
And a lot of my clients are monolingual Spanish speakers. That lease becomes invalid because it's not in Spanish. Okay. So speak like truly don't like, you don't have folks be embarrassed about that. Like, no, do you talk to the landlord in English? No, I talk to them in Spanish. So why are you writing in English? <laughs> Write in Spanish. Write in Spanish. Do the text in Spanish. Um, just have it in writing in some way. Um, a lot of the times, too, we get calls. Landlords will try to harass tenants and call animal control on them. This has happened many of times. And animal control will come out and be like, no, the dog's fine. So if that happens... Just ask animal control to provide a report. We came out here, everything was fine. To try to get something or a letter from animal control so they can they can start tracking the fact that there's been harassment um, and that they can deny these false claims. And then last but not least, join a tenant group. Truly throughout the United States and particularly in California, um, uh, there are lots of tenants unions that have been formed. Um, Philadelphia has a great, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Philly, Philly has great tenants unions. Um, Kansas City has um, a great tenants unions. DC has formed tenants unions. And the reason is kind of like, like, I don't know, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous for tenants. It's like Tenants Anonymous. Because once tenants get to know one another, what's kind of funny or crazy about it is that sometimes they even know the same owner. Or it's like a big management company. And then one tenant starts like talking about like, hi, my name is Diana and I live in this place and my property manager is a real jerk. And then someone's like, wow, that's the same jerk I have. They're like, it is. And it's like joining forces, right? There's more tenants than owners, y'all. There's more tenants than owners. There's more power in the people. And so the more that we join together, the more that we talk about it, the more that we share and know that we're protected and there's rights, the more power that there is. So joining a tenant group is one of the things that um, you can advocate or find. And if you're having a, um, I mean, just Google your local, like, you know, tenant union in your area. And I'm like, that, I'm like, that's it. That's it for questions. But what I also wanted to share with everyone is that we have a free self-paced course on the Maddie's University um, that goes more in depth about housing rights, um, telling about your protections, telling what protections are available for tenants. This was just kind of like a quick little uh, crash course, but please, I'm like, it's so, I'm like, it was so fun. It was fun to, great to, fun to put together. Um, so please take it and have your staff take it. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to expand on this, on this course too, because um, it's the primer, uh, the primer of, you know, know your rights, know your rights and keeping tenants and pets together. And here's my contact info. And then I'll take any other, like, you know, questions, comments, whatever it may be for like the next, you know, good 10 minutes. Does anybody have questions, comments, a specific question that um, that came to mind or issues that come up that haven't been, that were kind of touched on or covered? Hi. Hi. I'm Lydia. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Lydia. I'm from Good. the Living Rescue Alliance. Hey. Um, I just wanted some clarification for emotional support. You said yes. that there are animals that, that have to be domesticated. Otherwise, they can be anything, right? Yeah, I mean, they have to be, they have to be anim well, animals that are allowed, that are legally allowed. So okay. it can't be like a, you know... Um, I the don't... peacock that the lady tried to get on the airplane. Correct. Yeah, okay. peacock. Yeah. Can't be a peacock. <laughs> Or bearded dragon, you know, the, what yes. about snakes and, you know, things snakes, that are not Snakes can be, snakes can be a support animal. It okay. just depends on like what type of, I mean, it can't be like a snake that's like an illegal snake. Yeah. Okay. I have no idea. I, I'm like, okay. I, I'm like, I, I'm like, I don't know what an illegal snake would be, but snake could be a support animal. And the reason that I say this is because what about folks that, um, a person that has mobility issues, so they can't necessarily have a dog because they can't walk their dog all the time but mm -hmm. they can have their emotional support snake because the snake just like you know <laughs> litters on them like uh that was like britney spears for a moment okay <laughs> <laughs> do you know how much slave for you no yeah i i, I, I get it <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so much yeah no problem i was going back to my vma days not my vma days remember the video of music award when britney came out with the yellow snake anyone am i aging myself Anyways, do you remember Brittany, right? We remember no, that Brittany. was iconic. That was iconic. That was iconic. Thank I've you so a, much. I've got a question. 
Yeah, yes. I got a question for you that actually came to the Maddie's Pet Forum inbox. So oh. uh, someone wrote to us and they said, I fostered a, uh, a friend, I fostered for a friend of a friend for six weeks this summer. I fell in love with the pet, but they could not find anyone to take care of her. So they said, I got an ESA letter, but I'm now facing eviction because I breached the lease before getting the ESA letter. I don't want to take the animal to a shelter. What can they do in that situation? Okay, so great question. So it doesn't matter when you when your support and when you get your letter. So a lot of times, exactly like this happens. So they get a notice, right, saying like, "Oh, you're not allowed to have a pet," and then you give them a letter afterwards, and the landlord's like, "Oh, well, isn't that convenient? You got your letter after the notice," and you're like, "It is. It is really convenient. <laughs> sure is. Sure is convenient. Sure is convenient." So even though they got the letter afterwards, the support animal is the support animal. It's not like the support animal all of a sudden became the support animal because they got the letter. It was already a support animal. They just happened to get the letter afterwards. So it is still valid and they can still fight that eviction and not have to move because they have their letter. Okay. And then in the chat, it says, um, so the no pets clause really doesn't matter. The no pets clause really doesn't matter for people with disabilities that have a support animal, okay? That's the key, y'all. You need to be a person with a disability for fair housing laws to apply. Until we change it completely where pets can't be, that you can't be discriminated against you're, for just having a pet, kind of like kids, the kicker or like the, the hook is that you need to be a person with a disability or it needs to be a person with a disability. Oh, Susan, you're great. I'm like, is there a you in Indianapolis? I'm like, is there a you, Susan, wherever I'm at? Because you're awesome. Um, do you have guidance for anyone who has Kaiser and can't get a letter? I mean, I think just like um, reporting it. I, I mean, let me know. I, let me know where you're at. Um, I, I'm like reporting it. I just think like making it, maybe like putting it in writing. I know, Sarah, California. Okay, email me too, Sarah, because this is an issue from, um, this is just a big issue in terms of Kaiser. Kaiser up north is fixing it. Kaiser down in LA is still having issues. Um, I mean, yeah, short of trying to get a letter from from um, get a letter from someone else, right? Um, but I would have them. I would try to have them put something in writing. Um, in terms of, are you telling me that Kaiser is not providing, you know, letters uh, letters for people that have a disability and their animal alleviates symptoms of their disability? I would state it like that and then see what they write back um, so that you have something in writing. So then when you're like emailing me and they're like, they said this, I'm like, ooh, ha, 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 um, because this is a bigger issue. And I'm, I'm talking to like another agency that, you know, that does statewide kind of like more impact litigation because this is something that's an issue in California. Is there a list of what is a disability? Yes, each state has a list of what is a um, what is a disability. Um, we will put in the resources. I will get that out at least for California, so that you can have like a what is examples. It's not it's not saying that if it's not on there, it's not necessarily considered a disability. It's just kind of like a list of things that are an emotional, an emotional, mental, or physical impairment. For example, in the state of California. Um, any type of cancer is also considered a disability, right? And that's not something that necessarily you see. Um, severe diabetes is considered a disability. And so there's things that like you are unseen that can still be considered a disability. Incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Such great information as always. I learned something new from you every single time you talk. Um, we're going to wrap things up and let you all get a little jump, hopefully, on everyone's holiday weekend. Thank you again for joining us. Diana will be available on Maddie's Pet Forum to continue the discussion. So if you have any other questions that pop up or you want to see some additional resources, be sure to check out um, that link that Allison dropped in the chat. And thank you all. Hope you all have a good holiday and a happy new year. Yes. Thank you, everyone.